Hi, my name is Venkat and I work at Razorpay as a senior architect. And I have with me my colleague Srinidhi, who works as a senior software engineer at Razorpay. Today, we would love to talk about improving the developer experience and how we build a cloud native dev stack for hundreds of engineers. A quick overview into what Razorpay does. Razorpay enables frictionless payment, banking, and lending experiences for different classes of merchants of various scales and sizes. Today, we process billions of transactions for millions of merchants across the country. Razorpay has been at the forefront of innovation over the last several years in terms of transforming the financial ecosystem in the country. A quick motivation into why we actually embarked upon this journey. Over the last four years, our engineering headcount has actually grown up by 10x. Uh, in that process, we have scaled up our teams into full-fledged pods and BUs, four BUs, uh, and 30 plus pods. Uh, we had embarked upon microservices journey uh, a couple of years back. And today we have about 100 plus microservices. And it, just in the last two years, uh, the number of microservices has increased to about 50. Uh, we've had three company acquisitions, three acquisitions uh, across the course of time. That has led to a polyglot uh, stack of various languages like PHP, Golang, Python, Java, et cetera. Overall, we do roughly about 1,500 deployments per month. Now, a quick look at what our CACD practice looks like. Uh, this is not really very different from the way many companies operate, but uh, just to give a perspective and sort of build up the motivation for the kind of problems that we're dealing with. Uh, at a very, very high level, developers commit code into GitHub. Uh, we heavily use GitHub CI integration, uh, GitHub Actions uh, for our CI integration. Uh, so the GitHub Actions basically builds uh, images, which are Docker images, uh, uh, runs a variety of unit tests and pushes it into our private Docker registry. Uh, as soon as these images are available, the developers uh, typically start deploying that code with Spinnaker. Spinnaker is an open source uh, develop CS, a CD platform created by Netflix. So the deployment process is very similar. In a pre-prod environment, uh, they, they run a variety of integration tests, load tests if needed, and a bunch of other tests. Once the developer is satisfied with the test reports, the developer goes on to deploy the code in a canary environment. Uh, again, via Spinnaker's Kayanta, we run a variety of canary threshold metrics. Uh, and what that means is that uh, we sort of uh, leverage our monitoring and tracing infrastructure for actually making sure that the canary tests pass. Once the canary thresholds are uh, met or processed, uh, the deployment is, deployment is moved forward into production. In case the canary thresholds do not pass, the deployment is rolled back. Uh, in general, we use AWS as our infrastructure uh, where most of our uh, all our code runs. Uh, we are a heavy proponent of Kubernetes, uh, very specifically somewhere uh, in 2016, late 2016 is when we start our Kubernetes journey. We, we can probably say that we are, we are probably the first company uh, uh, in the country to have actually uh, uh, you know, managed a full production grade Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, while today, uh, we run managed uh, Kubernetes via EKS. Uh, like I mentioned, because of the fact that we are on Kubernetes, all, our, all of our packaging is done via Helm. Uh, Spinnaker is something that we mentioned. Uh, our entire infrastructure is on code via Terraform. And specifically for self-serve uh, infrastructure provisioning, we have enabled Atlantis where developers can actually come and provision any cloud resource that they probably want. And again, GitHub Actions is something uh, that we use for all the continuous integration and the Docker image building. So with this uh, uh, you know, principle in mind, uh, we can sort of notice that there is a tremendous amount of uh, deployment time that the developers spend in terms of uh, you know, rolling out their features, uh, you know, faster and actively into production. Uh, where they specifically, uh, in the development uh, uh, dependencies themselves, because of the number of engineers and the number of microservices that we're sort of dealing with, uh, it, this leads to a sequential development process. And what that means is that, uh, as, imagine there's a single service and there's a bunch of developers uh, who are working on those features. Uh, each developer uh, will have to take some time to actually deploy their code uh, into a, a pre-prod environment. And this development process is largely um, sequential and they have to coordinate with other developers in terms of deploying so that their changes are not overridden by other developers. The other part of the problem is because there's a heavy dependency on uh, AWS resources, most of the uh, AWS resources are mocked on uh, the local uh, development environment which leads to uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, confidence issues in terms of pushing the code to production. Uh, testing again, even a single line of code change requires the entire development process, entire deployment process before the developers can start testing their code. Uh, the, uh, on the right-hand side uh, is another set of problems with a shared environment. And what I mean by a shared environment is this. So I, as a developer, I'm working on service A, while service A has a dependency on service B. Uh, obviously, because 
my change is only affecting service A, I don't need to necessarily build service B. While I'm testing my service, uh, imagine there's a developer who's working on service B, and they end up changing uh, the, the deployment of service B on a pre-prod environment, my test starts breaking. And how do you sort of cost-effectively scale, not just my own individual services, but also the shared environments? And today that's quite difficult, unless and until there's a lot of cost thrown at it. The other part of the problem is that this leads to also a, a fact of the shared in, environment imposing a lot of constraints in terms of being able to demo uh, the product or the features to the business or the product counterparts. Um, again, there could be uh, demo restrictions or there could be, uh, you know, as I'm doing, things can change. Uh, so this leads to a lot of, uh, you know, time loss in one sense. The third part of the problem in the nature of the environment that we live in, we indulge in a variety of integrations with third-party gateways, payment gateways, partners, etc. Many of these integrations sometimes can run from weeks, uh, maybe even sometimes a month. Uh, and what that means is that every single such integration uh, requires a separate uh, service fleet of sorts, which uh, which is useful for that particular integration themse- itself. So how do you sort of really build these uh, these kind of uh, you know uh, shared uh, environment uh, in a cost-effective fashion? While all of this is there, there are also challenges on the infra provisioning, and specifically, uh, like I mentioned, all our infrastructure is on core and Terraform. Uh, this requires developers to go through a cognitive overload of uh, learning Terraform DSL uh, for provisioning even simple uh, things like an SQS endpoint or an SNS endpoint. Uh, more specifically, like I mentioned, because of the entire development process, debugging even trivial one-line change sometimes requires the developers to context switch between the actual application and probably like a logging platform or a distributed tracing platform. Uh, more specifically, there's a lot of time that is spent in just building and deploying the images themselves. Um, depending on you know the complexity and the nature of the tests or the uh, unit tests themselves, uh, there's a significant amount of time, and this means that feature development is largely sequential and iterative, and uh, it's not independently. Uh, it cannot be done today. What it actually means, all of this actually means, is that while the development time uh, can be used for doing a lot more productive and constructive things. Today, there's a lot of time that is getting wasted by the developers just in setting up uh, the deployment, uh, the corresponding infrastructure, and being able to just debug their code and uh, move forward uh, with their feature development. And what this simply means is that we need to simplify the developer workflow. We need to reduce the rollout uh, time to rollout or the cycle time, as they say, uh, in an independent fashion and uh, in, a, in, a, in a simple fashion. With that, I would like to hand over to Srinidhi, my colleague, Will walk you through the journey on how you're solving these problems. Thanks, Venkat, uh, for the brief uh, introduction. And talking about the goals of the project, we are primarily focusing on reducing the cognitive load on developers. And that is being achieved by one, having a streamlined workflow, two, having environmental consistency, and three, providing a faster feedback loop from local development. Uh, the following are the key decision factors on which the solution was built upon. The first one being to rely completely on open source and have zero vendor lock-in. Uh, the next one is uh, to make sure that the solution is Kubernetes native as our environments are in Kubernetes. Uh, the third important one is to have a hassle-free onboarding, which means that we wanted to onboard application with minimal changes and also not drastically change the development or deployment life cycle. And last but not the least, we wanted to have a cost effective solution that will make sure that we don't burn cash in order to get ephemeral infrastructure. Our solution is lightly opinionated and is what fits our use cases best and is not a complete pass solution. So the code name of this particular uh, solution is DevStack, and this is a razor-based journey towards a better development life cycle. So let's try to understand the solution by asking uh, a series of question and answers and coming to a logical conclusion before the demo. The first one is on how do we bypass the CI-CD loop for the iterative development, and the need is to have uh, directly expose the local code onto the 
cloud environment. So as a v1 version of the solution, we went ahead with telepresence, which followed a proxy based approach. So telepresence was a client that was sitting in both the local system and the remote cluster and made sure the connection happens through a tunnel. It took care of the DNS resolution, volume mounting and also networking. But there was a major drawback due to the whole tunneling approach, which was that the uh, responses were slow, the connectivity issues were with the database and also sometimes connectivity issues with the uh, cluster in itself and also uh, along with VPN, there were a lot of uh, bottlenecks. So how do we avoid the network limitations and uh, how can we ship code to the remote container without relying on the network? Uh, so we had to shift the approach towards a file sync based where uh, we used a tool called DevSpace. So DevSpace syncs the local code into the remote container in a very efficient manner. And it also does live reloading by container restart. DevSpace also has port forwarding and log streaming that provided scope for further features. Uh, as, as it all looked good, uh, there was an hiccup, sort of a limitation per se due to the container restarts. So the container restarts, which are bound by Kubernetes probe, uh, were flaky at times and also uh, not completely reliable. So we wanted something that was better and faster. So the next question is on how do we avoid these container restarts? So in order to avoid the container restarts, we had to put in a library inside the container that will take care of the hot reloading. So there are a lot of libraries per language uh, like compile daemon for golang, nodemon for node.js and so on, who rely on watching for the files that are changed. These are the files that are synced by uh, dev space and then it rebuilds the binary and then runs the new one, which is made available to the server. So this effectively avoids the container restart, thus not breaking the flow. So we could have a generic Docker container per language built and use that container with the dev space command in order to make sure this <clears throat> onboarding is seamless. So all of these three questions helped us to solve the problem of local sync. So we now short circuited the feedback loop by just running a command. So next question is on uh, how do we provide or orchestrate multiple services? How can the developers declaratively define and apply service dependencies? And uh, the solution for that is Helm file, which is a wrapper on top of Helm. So Helm file helps us to compose several charts together to create a comprehensive deployment artifact for anything from a single application to the entire infrastructure tag, stack. Uh, so we define a term called uh, service fleet here, which is a collection of microservices that are required by the developer for his or her workflows. Uh, so this Helm file works seamlessly with the existing Helm packages as all of our applications already had Helm packages and we didn't want to or uh, need to write uh, extra thing. We just had to wrap all of them in a single YAML file and provide it as it is given in the uh, in this right side of the uh, of the screen. So Helm file when uh, took care of all the Kubernetes resources orchestration uh, and that solved major of a problem with respect to providing Kubernetes resources like your deployment, service, ingress, job, cron job, and uh, whatnot. But uh, the application is not wholesome without the other requirements, which are like, for example, uh, SQSs or databases or AWS resources, which are not completely on Kubernetes. So the next question is on how do we provision ephemeral infrastructure resources. So we used or uh, relied upon Helm hooks for this provisioning. So Helm hooks provided a plug and play model to maintain the dynamics of applications auxiliary requirements. What we mean by that is uh, we have written a two to three uh, or per requirement based uh, Helm hooks which can be plugged into application based on a requirement. So if 
for example an application is using sqs queues they can plug in a sqs configurator as a hook whereas an application using kafka queues could plug in a kafka configurator similarly for all the other resources the plug and play model will fit in and in order to also avoid the uh, aws overridden or maintaining aws resources which was done via terraform we used local stack which provided a framework for mocking aws components so this is how a helm file workflow will look like on running the command uh, the chart is being verified and it runs a bunch of uh, pre-installed hooks which makes sure that the auxiliary requirements for the application is up and then it loads the charts the kubernetes resources and deploys them into the kubernetes cluster and then does some post install hooks as well which will which can include like uh, the ingress route configuration or uh, validation of the manifest generated and make sure that the ephemeral service or the ephemeral infrastructure per developer is available by just running one command so this is how we solve the problem of having a streamlined workflow for the developers in order to bring up their ephemeral service fleet so now with uh, uh, ephemeral infrastructure using helm file and local sync using dev space uh, there is one piece in the whole puzzle that needs to be sorted which is on how do we make sure the traffic is routed to the right user service so for that we use header based routing our ecosystem or our Kubernetes cluster have uh, have been using traffic for ingresses and uh, we upgraded that to traffic 2.0 which supported header based uh, routing out of the box. So the traffic ingress route configuration will have multiple rules in order to uh, guide it to the dynamic routing. So for example, in, in the right hand side of the presentation, uh, we have two services uh, which are uh, API web and API web Srinidhi and based on the header uh, traffic will make sure that the request that uh, comes with the header is propagated to the API web Srinidhi service which in turn puts the request into the API web Srinidhi deployment or a pod. Uh, so this is how we have enabled uh, header based routing to solve the uh, routing problem and uh, the next set of uh, question is on how do we make sure the upstream services are routed uh, properly as well and we use header propagation there and we have piggybacked on open tracing where open tracing by default uh, uh, propagates the header and we rely on that uh, where at every service the traffic will read the header and route it to the appropriate service. Let's walk through a use case on, on how does that routing work, uh, the routing overview. Uh, for example, let's take a use case where we have two applications, app one and app two, and assume app one being a gateway service and app two is an actual service that uh, prop processes a request and gives a uh, response. Uh, so we have three developers who are working on uh, both of these microservices where developer one is explicitly working on app one and developer two is working on app two. Whereas developer three is working on a feature that spans between app one and app two. Now by running the helm file command, the developers would have configured the infrastructure. Now let's see how the request routing happens so developer one on passing the request uh, header dev one in the request uh, the ingress route uh, that is uh, present in front of app one will make sure that the request is routed to the dev one instance of the app one and then the request will propagate into the uh, app 2 and given that the dev 1 label is not present in the configuration it will route it to the default shared infrastructure uh, so taking into a use case of uh, the second uh, developer on passing the header dev 2 into the request the request will flow into the shared stage infrastructure of application 1 as there is no instance of uh, dev 2 running here and it would propagate it to the dev2 instance of the 
uh, app two version that is running because the configuration would be there. And also in the last case, when the header feature one is passed, the request will be routed to the feature one instance of app one, and then the feature one instance of the app two as both of these are present. So this is how the request routing will now happen across the microservices. And uh, this enables us in order to run only a subset of microservices required for the functioning of the application. All the other routing can happen smartly to the stage infrastructure that is already there and running uh, with the header based configuration. So let's move on to some of the practical implementation of this solution and see how it works in real world. And uh, this is the demo. Let's open our terminal and run a command now, which will enable us to create a, the ephemeral infrastructure. Helm file sync uh, is the command that is required. And uh, the command now has started to create ephemeral resources for a couple of services. And let's look into what they are uh, while the build is happening or the deployment is happening. Uh, so we have uh, a file called helm file.ml, which will define the service fleet. So in this case, we have used two services dashboard, which is a front end of Razorpay and API, which is a back end of Razorpay and API is being written in PHP. The image here is the commit ID of the dep of the branch that I'm working on. And also the same is the Docker image tag. So the image tag we use in Razorpay is uh, the commit uh, hash of the uh, of the branch that we are working on and just take a notice of one thing which is called the dev stack label so this particular label holds the key for the ephemeral infrastructure all of our infrastructure ephemerally are created with the suffix of this uh, this particular uh, label so now that the helm file has completed its job it has created uh, ephemeral resources for api and dashboard and it says how we can access it so we'll have to either access it via passing a header for header propagation or using the url directly which is a preview url uh, the same thing works for the other microservices as well let's quickly check what are the kubernetes resources that it has created so when i do kubectl get pods hyphen and api we can see that there is a Srinidhi demo that is running. And also if we can just check the dashboard resources, there is also be a Srinidhi demo that is running. Also take a notice of all the other labels that are working this and this is the live uh, infrastructure that we are running on and all the other developers are parallelly working while we are demoing. So this is the standard uh, uh, dashboard of Razorpay. Let's see how we can access our specific resource. So we'll use a plugin called uh, mod header, which injects the header into the request that go through your browser. You can also use Postman by adding this header or use curl request to, to add the header. So let me now just refresh the page to see whether the changes of my branch are being reflected. And uh, as you can see, the color has changed to green, which is the feature that we are uh, uh, probably demoing. So let's go and see the code of uh, the same branch that is there and the color is uh, green. So now at this point of time, we have created ephemeral infrastructure separate from the all the developers working and we can access it by giving just a header. So let's just see how we can work on iteratively working on the feature from the local code. So we just change the uh, content in the file, go to our uh, terminal, run another command called dev space dev. So dev space dev takes care of syncing the local code into the remote cluster. So in this case, the code in user Srinidhi code app API is being synced into slash app slash app. And also the service PHP file, which I just changed is being shown as synced. So we can quickly validate that by refreshing the page and uh, seeing the seeing whether the color has got changed. And uh, here you go, the color has now changed to blue. So let's, for some reason, I don't like this color. Let's go ahead and change it to another one and see how 
it will reflect. So I'll change the color or change the code in my IDE, go to my browser and refresh. So dev space in the backend would have synced the file automatically and the change is reflected in my browser. So this is how simple the workflow will be with the adoption to the dev stack. And this particular example is for an interpreted language uh, like PHP. And we'll just jump into another example where we see how a compiled language like Go works. Now for the demo purposes, we have already created uh, uh, another service called Capital Cards. Uh, which uh, deals with uh, the cards uh, uh, of uh, Razorpay and we'll just walk through the Helm uh, templates before going into the uh, demo. So there are multiple deployments that are present which are your Kubernetes resources. Uh, these are the hooks that uh, we mentioned about which will be run as either post install or pre install. So this is an ingress route configurator which will update the ingress route. Uh, there is a preview URL hook as well. There is a secret updater uh, hook that runs, uh, uh, which updates the secret. And there is also a SQS configurator. So this particular application is an asynchronous one with the web worker and SQS queues. And we are configuring SQS queues dynamically and also having a service, which is a Kubernetes resource. So now that uh, we have already created the deployments, let's just validate that. So on doing a kubectl get parts, uh, there are the web and uh, the worker parts that are created. We can also go ahead and see the SQS resources that are created. And this is the local stack UI. So this is the particular SQS queue that is created for capital cards. And this is the URL in which it can be accessed. So likewise, we have created the Kubernetes resources and also the ephemeral infrastructure resources. Let's run the dev space command in order to sync our local code into the uh, remote cluster. And uh, on inspection, while the sync is happening, let's walk through the dev space YAML file. So it has multiple uh, uh, divisions where it replaces the pods with the dev stack uh, Docker container that we built, which is nothing but the compiled daemon one. And then it syncs our local code into the remote. And also it excludes a few paths which will optimize the syncing. So these are the files that are probably not required for the uh, for the binary to work. And also it has logs part where we can see the logs of the container that we have synced with. Let's see the status of the dev space command. And yes, it has started to uh, run the command. Uh, it has started to sync, which is basically uh, at this point where it, where it's sync the code and then it is uh, running the build command which is nothing but the go build uh, hyphen o and then it has run it run the binary that has been built and these are the logs that it prints in order to make sure that the debugging is easier so let's just access this by making a curl request and he, as you can see, the request is now reaching because I have used a preview URL. Uh, so let's just go ahead and make some change into the code, which is a Golang code. So what we'll do is probably add the, add the loggers in order to uh, print the request logging. So there are two loggers that I have uh, commented out. I'll just uncomment it and save the file. So right now the workflow is that dev space watching these file changes has synced the file of helpers, which is there here. And then the same process of uh, building and running the uh, new binary is, has happened. And let's just validate that by hitting a request. And here you go. The changes that have done are being reflected dynamically in an interpreted language as well. Moving on uh, to the additional features uh, that are supported by DevStack, the first one is the preview URL. Uh, and as uh, seen in the demo, this creates a specific URL uh, per DevStack label for an application by using the ingress route and the preview URL uh, configuration is provided in the slide. Uh, the next part of it is the ephemeral databases. We currently support three different ways of configuring the database, which are one, a local database where the developers run their 
uh, DB instance locally and we reverse proxy the request into the local system. The second one is the ephemeral database where developers can span ephemeral databases based on the uh, preceded data and also make sure that the schema is synced with the pre prod environment and also have the dev migrations run. The last one is the persistent database where the developers can opt to use a pre-existing uh, database of uh, stage or beta or a pre-prod which is regularly controlled by the data ops flow. So the workflow of an ephemeral database is, is that we copy the stable stage environment into S3 which is acting as a base and then the data container based on this will be generated and uh, migrations run on top of it which gives an ephemeral database which is isolated from others. So are we really looking into the cost? Uh, the primary goal of us to is to have a cost optimal solution, right? Uh, so cube generator is the tool that takes care of all the cleanups. So our resources, all of the ephemeral resources uh, have been tagged with a TTL of six hours by default and the developers can override it based on their requirements. So generator will make sure that it cleans up the resources when the TTL is expired. And also in order to solve the requirements of ups and downs, uh, the upscaling and downscaling, we use cluster autoscaler and spot nodes. Uh, we also do monitoring of uh, all of these resources via Prometheus, where we attach labels to every deployment and all of them are queried in a Grafana dashboard. So this is how the solution looks like in from the angle of uh, uh, tools where we have different uh, components of dev orchestrator, uh, cluster manager, infra monitoring and routing. And uh, this particular diagram specifically explains us how the pre and post dev stack will be, where a sequential development workflow is replaced by multiple parallel ecosystem of uh, things working with local sync. Uh, what is the impact on dev productivity? We have seen a 10 to 15x reduction in time to take feature live because per feature, the time has been reduced from five hours to 30 minutes and per iterations, it has come down to two minutes, which was 20 to 30 minutes earlier due to container builds and all the other regular process. So these are the, some of the features that we are planning to uh, go ahead. And uh, given that we emphasize on open source, we wanted to give back to the community as well, which is where we are recording all of the details and reference implementation in this open source repo. Feel free to raise issues or contribute back in order to make developers life easier. Thank you and any questions.